blueprint intergovernmental agency to order. Um, glad everybody was able to make it this afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, if there is anyone from the public who would like to uh, address the board, there are speaker cards in the back, right next to where Max Hurley is standing right now. Max, raise your hand. There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can fill out a speaker card. <laughs> and uh, if you would turn it in to uh, Ms. Yolanda uh, at the desk there, we'll give you uh, time on the agenda today to speak. Um, Ben, would you go over the agenda modifications at yes. this point? Yes, sir. Only one agenda modification, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. It's uh, pull, uh, pulling from consent item number two. Okay. It's the only modification for approval of the IA. Okay. Mr. Move the rest of consent. Thanks. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Motion by uh, Board Member Maddox, seconded by Board Member Deloge to accept the consent agenda. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, uh, Opposed, like sign. Hearing none, the uh, motion passes unanimously. Okay, Mr. Chairman, uh, item number two, which we'll get to momentarily, actually has to do with bringing forward an additional time on your agenda for citizens to be heard on non-agended items. We went ahead and built the, right. um, the agenda for you today with that in it. Right. So that's your next section on the agenda. Okay. And, and that, you know, we've made that consistent. I'm, I'm hoping we'll make it certainly consistent across uh, agendas. We're doing it at the City Commission, uh, the CRA, uh, and certainly here at the IA. Mr. Chair, move staff recommendation on item number two. Uh, well, where we are now is actually citizens to be heard, if there are any. Oh. Are there any citizens to be heard? Do you have any cards, Shalanda? Okay, there are no citizens to be heard, so we are now at items <coughs> Uh, next, actually, would be the uh, oh, from the, the chairman. Yeah, chairman. the citizen advisory it's, it's committee chairman chairman's here. report. Uh, Mr. Harding is the chairman. I know he's not here. Is Miss Peppers here to okay. present some words? All right. Uh, right. You would come to the microphone, Miss Pepper. Give us your name and address for the record and the report from the citizen advisory committee. Hi, um, Elva Peppers, and uh, I'm the vice chair. As um, okay was stated that JR couldn't be here today, but I'd just like to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm a biologist and was appointed to the um, committee a, a little less than a year ago. So okay. um, our update, um, there were a couple items removed from the agenda before uh, that we didn't discuss, which I'm sure you have there. Um, the presentation by NGT Consulting on the disparity study and the authorization to proceed with procurement for Northeast Corridor. So we didn't discuss those items. Um, we did welcome three, three new members um, for their first meeting. And uh, those were Linda Vaughn representing the senior community, Sean McGlynn representing Big Ben Environmental Forum, and Daniel Petronio serving as a financial expert. Um, the consent agenda was approved and included in that was another new uh, nominee, Jim McShane, and he's with Career Source of Capital Region. And he's been nominated by the Big Ben Minority Chamber of Commerce. We don't. Um, so the remainder of our uh, discussion uh, revolved around uh, updates to the current projects and proposed projects, um, the status report on the uh, blueprint projects coming up, which those were all very interesting. And some of our members had a few comments on those, but uh, there were no major items brought up. Um, and then we had the acceptance of the status report on the um, OEB. And the only, the, there, those were also very interesting. Hopefully you guys look at all that and it's, it's very interesting to see what's going on. Um, we also requested and received a minor update um, from Christina about the disparity study, which I'm particularly interested in, so I'm gonna bring that up, <laughs> um, that it's supposed to be completed and the report presented uh, in June of 2019. 
Um, and then the final was the acceptance of the status report um, of the Applied Science and Advanced Manufacturing Target Industries, which also was very interesting. And I understand we had the Magnet MagLab Open House was it last weekend or weekend before? You are forgiven. <laughs> anyway, that is the conclusion of my report, and you'll probably see JR here next time. Okay, thank you so much. Are there any questions of the vice chair? All right, <clears throat> thank you so much. We appreciate your volunteer service, you and everyone on the, uh, on the Citizen Advisory Committee. Your input is invaluable to us as we make decisions about uh, what happens uh, with the uh, intergovernmental agency and the projects that we have going forward. And we certainly look forward to working with you all as we begin to bring those projects online uh, in the next 20 years. I'm sure you'll be around, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're Thank welcome. you so much. It was good to meet you. All right, uh, board members, we, it is not reflected on your agenda, but we are at item two. Yes, sir. Item number two, items pulled from the consent agenda, and I'm going to uh, recognize Commissioner Matlow for some discussion on that item. <laughs> Commissioner Matlow. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just asked for this to be pulled because when I first opened it, I felt like I was reading the Apple Terms of Service and <laughs> sign on the bottom line and <laughs> didn't really know what, what all these changes were about. So I went back and I know Commissioner Miner had requested to um, have citizen yes. participation at the beginning. Uh, and, and that makes extra uh, sense. And I sent up some follow-up questions, which I think I think you gave to everybody. And, and I think the first two are great. And then on um, the third question that I asked, I, I thought there's still room for a little bit more uh, discussion based on um, the answers. Um, and I'm a pizza maker, not a lawyer. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> be pretty warned. But uh, th th these are the things that, that kind of <laughs> had me ask more questions and I thought I had answers for. And in the new version, it read, uh, the director of place and agency staff shall draft the meeting agenda and supporting documentation for items that require board action is described herein. Uh, city staff and county staff shall notify director of place of city and county items for placement on the agenda. And the director of place may accept or reject agenda items based on length, time sensitivity, or applicability. And I, I guess my question there was, um, with the restructuring of how the agenda comes out, I was wondering who is actually even submitting items that are being rejected. Is it uh, board directors? Is it the IMC? Is it staff? Or, or what's that? I'm happy to. Sure. It, normally speaking, the agendas will flow up from uh, many of the people that are sitting at the table, right? So uh, the director of Blueprint or the director of OEV through my office. Uh, the way the process works is we work on that agenda material and we'll We'll cross collaborate depending on if it's a city IA issue or a county IA issue, maybe the director of uh, public works for either, either agency, et cetera. But that ultimately will move forward up the chain of command to the IMC before publication occurs. That's, okay. that's normally the way it's been, and this doesn't do anything to change or modify that, sir. Okay, and, and the part that was deleted is what I, I guess caused me a little heartburn because it said uh, developing the draft agenda and supporting documentation based upon input um, from members of the Board of Directors, direction from previous agency meetings, IMC, Citizens Advisory Committee, Technical Coordinating Committee, Finance Committee, et cetera. And it just seemed like somebody went out of their way to make sure that um, we're developing the agenda collectively and getting as much input to it as possible. So I was a little bit concerned about seeing that part um, get deleted. Um, and then there was a second part um, that also was deleted where directors who desire the addition of an agenda item or the deletion of an agenda item um, will contact the city manager and it seemed like the path seemed a little more clear and then it became um, more modification the, you know yes sir ask the IMC for consideration but it, and it said you know they couldn't exclude it but if the director could exclude it and I guess uh, I, I know we're trying to make it simpler but I, I don't really know it's simpler because I can't really find the path for um, a director or um, one of our citizens committees, if they really had, wanted to get something on the agenda, um, what that path would be. And then I guess that final point um, on that last point was the 48 hour state law. Yes. Um, that makes sense, but it just, I guess you said in the bylaws it's the same thing. So I think that would make sense to have it be seven yeah, days seven and make days sure in the bylaws. it's in the bylaws. So make sure we're getting yeah. it to the public um, within, within um, seven days also. Uh, 
So, I mean, those are, those are I mean, they're, they're nitpicky, but we're also changing a lot of language, and I want to make sure we get it right with, sure. um, especially with all the new board members. So mm -hmm. it would be my recommendation, and, you know, I'd like to move that we do change um, the order of the meeting that Commissioner um, Minor recommended, but not make any of the other changes yet, and I'd like to come back and review it, and maybe if we could set up a meeting, a crash course meeting for the new people to review kind of all of the policies and go through it and weigh in um, from there. And like I said, there's a second of that motion. We'll get to discuss it more. Hold on. <laughs> well, I'm going to let him explain it first before sure. I take a motion. Um, I'll take take a couple. I, I don't know if I if I caught everything, but I will say the the process for a director, a, a board member, if you will, to modify the agenda, addition or deletion is is the same. You would go with the city commissioner to the city manager, at the county commissioner, to the county administrator. So that doesn't change whatsoever. You 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 did present completely accurately. So there's two documents that we utilize to guide us about how far in advance we publish or distribute the IA packet both to you all uh, on the IA as well as to the public. Um, that's the bylaws and this policy. This policy, staff did, full disclosure, modify to a, a, a line with state law, state notice requirements. But your bylaws remain the same at seven days. So the, the key takeaway there, as we discussed in, I think in most of the briefings, is seven days before these meetings, which are set usually up to a year in advance, we will be distributing to everybody. So I, I did want to clarify that. Of course, if the IA is more comfortable leaving that at seven days, we understand that. Um, but it was simply to conform with state law. Okay. And on, on the first point that um, it has, it directly states um, in the updated version that uh, something specifically requested by a director couldn't be removed um, mm -hmm. by the IMC, which, you know, I think that's good, but it didn't. It didn't clarify that under the director of place when things are getting rejected, and that was the first point that I was looking for more clarification on. Okay. I'd be happy to, Mr. Okay, Patrick, Mr. Chairman. if you would. Um, Mr. Commissioner, uh, the draft agenda is going through the place director, mm -hmm. but once it gets approved by the IMC, um, then modifications <coughs> that a commissioner will have, as, as Mr. Pungi you know, explained earlier, will go to the IMC through the individual, uh, either county administrator or city manager. Um, so nothing has changed. It was just reorganized, those provisions, but it's actually the exact same language that was previously in the policy. I, it seems like if nothing's Mr. changed, we'd rather just not change anything as long as it hasn't been any different. I, 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 I understand your point, but, and then, I mean, I guess further in that conversation is, um, that's after the draft agenda, so what will be the process for getting something onto the draft agenda? And I don't know if that's a bigger conversation or if... Well, um, sorry. Okay. Patrick. Mm -hmm. uh, the process is that actions that require... Um, a that come from the board down, mm -hmm. as, as Ben explained earlier. Uh, whatever action items that we, we need to bring back to you come from previous uh, board meetings, direction from the board. Um, and if, if an individual commissioner or board member would like to place something on the agenda, under the old policy, well, under the current policy, excuse me, you would go through the city manager or the county administrator, and that hasn't changed here. So w what you're seeing is uh, Staff is going to bring matters back on its agenda that require board direction mm -hmm. and from, you know, interactions with citizens advisory committees and follow-up uh, action required by the board. And I, I, Mr. Matlow, sorry, I uh, have no doubt what the practice is and not saying it's a bad practice, but when we're spelling out expl explicitly in a policy and then we're deleting some of the directives of how to develop the agenda, that's where um, I had concern, and for that to be in consent, figured it warranted more discussion. Okay. All right. Commissioner Dozier. Thank and you, And then Mr. Commissioner Chair. William Scott. Um, I appreciate the thorough reading. Um, I'm not the only one bringing up all these technical, no, I'm kidding about that. But digging in deep, um, this is a great way to start, uh, particularly if you haven't been at Blueprint meetings for a couple times. So I'm, I, I really appreciated your deeper dive into it, and I'm sure others did the same. For me, I think I was comfortable with the language. It seemed like it was streamlined a little bit. 
Um, I guess the other side of placing something on the agenda to me is if we had a policy where all 12 of us could add things to the agenda at any point, <coughs> it might be a little unwieldy um, for staff time and other things. So typically we'd bring things up here, right, and get board approval. And that's what you were saying, yes. that that is uh, not something that can be removed later, that if the board directs you all to bring something back, that has to happen. So that, that I may see a little differently and I'm more comfortable with that. I did pick up on the 48 hours, seven days, yes. and you and I talked about this in briefing. I understand the reasoning for making it, uh, the policy look like um, state law, but for consistency, um, I think we're standard seven days for commission meetings on both city and county. Mm -hmm. I would like to see that standard reflected just so there's no confusion in the future from the public or anyone else. We only meet quarterly, and I think you know that that time is valuable for all of us to digest the the um, agenda. So, I could support that modification. I am comfortable with the rest yes. um, as it as it is. Okay, Commissioner Williams Cox. I guess my um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and I guess my concern is that if nothing really changed. I guess the strikeout, as we talked about in briefing, it, all of the strikeout it was concerning to me. Uh, but if, if taking the time to go back and compare and see and all, all those kinds of things to see what what did change or what didn't change, I guess my question is, what was the purpose for this massive change at this point in time? <clears throat> Thank you, <laughs> Director. That it, it's a illustrative uh, um, and simple. Um, direct question, thank you. Uh, really, the, the policy that was created, and it was modified two years ago, but that was created at the advent of Blueprint, really was role focused. Um, it was based on, okay, if you're the place director, well, actually the place director wasn't there at the time. If you were the Blueprint director, this is what you did, or if you were the IMC, this is what you did. Mm -hmm. It didn't really go into how things are done by process. Um, and <laughs> completely owning this uh, confusion with, with apologies, we took the opportunity to just have it flow with how the process worked. And uh, that was the intent while not changing anything substantially apart from adding additional transparency with the exception of the 48 hours from the seven days. That is really the net net of it. Um, and uh, again, apologies if that was confusing, that was um, unintended. That answer your question, it does. Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Maddox. Mr. Chair, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it seems to be a little bit of, of confusion about um, the policies and, and what we're doing here today. And, and honestly, I, I think that uh, it may warrant some more time. I think what Commissioner uh, Minor asked for was simply for the citizens to be heard piece to be added to the agenda, uh, as I believe this other piece was added on to it. Correct. Um, and so what I would like to see, if, if, if at all possible, is for us to go ahead and approve the piece specifically, as, as Commissioner Mallow said, uh, related to the, uh, what Commissioner Minor asked for, and then bring the rest of it back after more briefings with, uh, with commissioners around the table who may have questions about it. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think this is a, a thing where, where staff is necessarily trying to trick anybody. But, but it, it may be a thing where everybody at the table doesn't understand what exactly the language means and why the, why the changes are being made. And I don't, I don't mind maybe waiting a meeting uh, to, to, to have that clarified for those who may be a little bit uh, confused as to what, what means what and why we're changing in the history behind why we've done what we've done. So I, I could go either way. I mean, I could go with all the changes that were there because I, I, I do understand it, not, you know, I've, but I've been here. Uh, eight nine years and so, but for for those who may have some questions, I don't want to ram it down their throats either. So I, I can go either way with this. Well, I, I don't think we're ramming it down okay. anybody's throat. Everybody was briefed. Yes, sir. And 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 rightly so. Uh, Commissioner Matlow had some questions and pulled it from consent, and we've had significant discussion. And so I will defer to you, uh, uh, Commissioner Matlow, if you want to make your motion or if you feel comfortable with where we are now uh, I'd like to keep the same motion which was similar to what um, Commissioner Maddox was saying and not that I think we need to scrap the language and the work you've done um, I like 
maybe not in this meeting, just to have additional conversation about how some of our citizens committees can, um, how their input flows in and, and, and strengthen the document and add some of that additional information. So if that would be possible, because okay. I think yeah. we've, I, I understand what you're saying about the changes in restructuring. I just like some additional clarity added to it. Okay, you want to make that motion? Yeah, I'll make that motion. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Motion by second. Commissioner Matt Lowe, uh, seconded by Commissioner Williams Cox to amend the recommendation today uh, to only include the language concerning adding the citizens to be heard uh, on the agenda. Is everybody comfortable with that motion? So uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign, motion carries unanimously. So staff then will bring us back the <coughs> additional information yeah. uh, that yes, was included in today's yes, item. Sir. Mr. Right, Chair. The next meeting. Uh, it, it, Commissioner Miner. If uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if we if this appears on the on the next agenda or yes. a future agenda, uh, could we please make that one change that Commissioner Dozier mentioned, which is retaining the seven day uh, yes. time frame yes. uh, on any future revision? Thank you. And yeah. to be very clear, that is what is standing after the motion you just approved. Right. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Chair. Co uh, Commissioner Maddox. Um I hesitate to say this, but when I realized what was happening, it, it, it kind of made me want to say it. Um, in the future, and I can see where, where sometimes it fits to do these types of things, but when a, co when a commissioner requests a specific thing, um, at least keep that agenda item to that specific thing unless there's extra direction coming from that commissioner during the item. I don't think that, and this is just my personal opinion, I don't think that these two should have been ever tied together because nobody expected them to be, even if we understood them. It should have been two separate items, because uh, what Commissioner Miner asked for was very straight, cut, and direct, and everybody understood, and we were ready to go with it. Uh, adding this piece about the uh, policy changes made it a little more complicated, so I would have liked to have seen it in a different item, because I, I know he didn't specifically ask for that to be a part of it. Um, I don't know what, if that reflects where everybody at, but I just, I just believe that, that if that's what he asked for, give him what he asked for, and, and if, if there's other things that you see there that you want to bring to our attention, bring it to, a, to our attention, but bring it to our attention in a different item. Mr. Chairman. Dan? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, I mean, I can tell you, uh, having been in the legislature, whenever amendments are made that way, uh, and we certainly don't have to do it the way the legislature does, but I can, uh, it leads me to understand why they did it. My the understand, I, did. I'm not even saying don't bring it up on the same day. I'm yes. just saying split it up into two items. So even if right. this would have been amendment, uh, consent item number two and number three, just give him number two and then put the other part in number three. That way okay. we can we can have two separate discussions about it. Okay, but typically, well, again, in, when when I was in the legislature, what they would do, even if an amendment was made to a statute, right, they would take that opportunity to update the statute if it was uh, if, if there were items or language in the uh, uh, statute that was amended, they'd do a strike through and. Add. So I understand why they might have taken that opportunity just to update, but but your point is well taken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so that's the direction from the board at this point. Commissioner Dozier. Just very quickly, Mr. Chair, I really appreciate your comment. And just to uh, piggyback on that with what we see on our local agendas. Right. We don't always look back at our policies, so I, I don't want to. I, I think clarity in how we describe these things is good in the agenda items. Why did you, looking at one change, identify other changes? But every time, if, if we have a new policy, I think something like this may have hit um, a question today with our staff. There's an opportunity to look back at an old ordinance, look right. back at old language, and we need to take those opportunities to update it. So I don't. We don't need to belittle or you know belabor this too much. I understand, but I think that without a motion, Commissioner Maddox, um, I just want to be careful with yeah. not uh, doing that necessary. That's, that's just my opinion. If nobody else agrees, you want to do it the way you want to do it. That's fine. I, I don't. I don't care either way. That's why I would like to see that different. All right. Is, is there consensus? I mean, I don't. I don't think it's ever been done. No, it, it hasn't been in the four years I've been on this board. Let me just say it. It has not been, but. Um, when you have, we've introduced several new folks like us, and it is very important that we start off right and that we understand because then we will continue. So I would just hope that there would be some patience oh, yeah. and some leniency 
as we get up to speed on perhaps what has been done, which because it has been done doesn't necessarily mean it is the best way. So we're looking for a ways to go forward in a manner that is comfortable to come to this table or to in briefings to say, I wish this had been done a different way. And I, I, and I think Ben is very, very receptive mm -hmm. to that. Cause, um, and so thank you for the work that you're doing and thank you for your foresight. We're just trying to make sure we're understanding and that we're, we're getting all that we need to do to be good representatives uh, for, for, the, for citizens. And so it may, not be, it may not have been a recurring problem, but we can't speak to what will happen in the future. So if we <coughs> want to go in a certain direction, now might be the time to go ahead and set that course. Mm -hmm. Your point is well taken. Okay. Okay. All right. Th thank you. I think you, you set the direction, uh, 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 board members, for that. So that brings us to item number eight. Yes, Under thank you. Under general business and presentations, the acceptance of the status report on blueprint in a governmental agency infrastructure projects. Mr. Director. Thank you very much, and thank you for that direction, seriously, um, IA members. We've got three items under general business for you today. We get to uh, have the opportunity to bring you up to speed on a lot of the great activities that have been going on, uh, certainly in the last quarter and kind of pivoting ahead to the next quarter, both in, in terms of the blueprint infrastructure side, the 2,000 projects, and also preparation for the uh, Blueprint 2020 projects. And then we'll hit a couple of pretty exciting areas in the Office of Economic Vitality arena. But at this point in time, and I'll walk around to give her the clicker, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Autumn Calder, the Director of Blueprint. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely want the clicker. We have some great <laughs> images, and they're timed with my presentation. Welcome, Autumn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at the last meeting, we did a deep dive into the Blueprint 2020 prioritization process and the results that led to our five-year work program and our fiscal year 2019 capital project allocations that were approved last September. Today's presentation highlights projects funded in this fiscal year, and we'll begin with the Blueprint 2000 project and close with some Blueprint 2020 projects that have been advanced. Starting with the Capital Cascades Trail Segment 3, which begins at Adams Street and runs westward to the Central Drainage Ditch, just past where the St. Mark's Trail and the Capital Cascades Trail meet, which is really just a stone's throw from Lake Bradford Road. And it's at this west end when we're, where we're going to be building next. We're continuing the partnership with the City of Tallahassee and advertising concurrently with the FAMU Way project for the regional stormwater facility and trailhead that are nestled between the railroad and FAMU Way southwest of the Gamble Street roundabout. And that roundabout has already been constructed. That was kind of the last piece of FAMU Way that was constructed. Constructing the city's FAMU Way project and our Cascades Trail project at the same time by the same contractor has led to cost savings and it delivers these improvements uh, more quickly to the public. This is the last piece of core infrastructure for segment three. The regional stormwater facility will improve our water quality by removing pollutants from the stormwater before they go downstream, and it adds a beautiful new amenity to the roadway. From a windshield or a bike saddle, this component embraces the design guidelines that were approved by our FAMUA Citizens Advisory Committee and that have already been seen on the previously constructed portions of Cascades Trail. Like Lake Anita anchors the east end, this pond will anchor the west end. The landscape and hardscape will match the improvements already constructed, and the nighttime LED lighting will be continued. As you can see here at Cascades Park, the pedestrian bridge over Monroe Street, and at Lake Anita Plaza, this corridor has a nighttime interplay. And this pond will carry that theme forward with programmable LED lights. Mm -hmm. And here's a trail view of the pond at night. Are those orange and green? Yes, ma'am. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> We will also construct, in partnership with the city's Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Affairs Department, a simple trailhead that utilizes the shade provided by two existing beautiful oak trees and provides parking, a bike repair station, and just a meetup spot across the roundabout from the St. Mark's Trail. The pond and the trailhead and the Family Way project will start this summer and will take no longer than two years to complete. At the same time we're constructing the pond, we're initiating the design of several key amenities in this special space that's squeezed between two universities and a historic neighborhood. 
This spring, we're advertising for a design build team that specializes in skate parks to design and build the skatable art component at Coal Sheet Pond. This team will build upon the public engagement that we've already begun and reach out for more as we develop this truly unique area for those who are just starting to learn to skate and those who are seasoned skaters. The trail around Coal Sheet Pond will be designed and we're working with CSX to gain a crossing over the railroad tracks to provide access up to the activity at College Town. We're also reserving space as the Night Creative Communities Initiative, or KCCI, works to refine their Red Hills Rhythm Project, which will surely activate this space in a creative and complementary way. Van Buren Street will be improved through resurfacing and adding 22 parking spaces. This will improve the functionality of Lake Anita Plaza and support the growing businesses in that area. And lastly, on Cascades Trail Segment 3, we have the History and Culture Trail, which includes interpretive panels and sculptural elements. We have a citizens working group that will re-engage this spring in advance of the RFP for the design and fabrication of the historical markers. We heard the conversation at last week's City Commission meeting about honoring Dr. Charles U. Smith somewhere along Family Way or Cascades Trail. And we believe it would be a great opportunity to develop this concept through the History and Culture Trail project if this IA board is supportive. In fact, Shauna Smith, the daughter of C.U. Smith, actually serves on our working group. And as we develop this project, we'll bring updates and a final concept to the IA board for approval. Today, we're seeking direction from this board to incorporate the recognition of Dr. Charles E. Smith through the History and Culture Trail project on Cascades Trail. Mr. Mr. Chairman, we can, we can pause the presentation if you'd like to address that now. Mr. Williams. Prior to this presentation, Autumn and I had a little sidebar because I was speaking with our local young historian. I don't know if he's in the room this morning at the um, CK Steel dedication. And uh, he was pointing to the, um, the request that the marker for Dr. C.U. Smith look like the one for uh, Reverend C.K. Steele along uh, FAMU Way. It would not be the re a renaming. It would be a marker uh, just commemorating uh, one like that one for Dr. C.K. Steele, <coughs> uh, Reverend C.K. Steele. If I'm not mistaken, what, what you're telling us is that the committee, uh, Commissioner Williams-Cox, would want to determine what would be appropriate and in line with what the trail looks like. It may not be a marker, but certainly something worthy of, but we're gonna let the committee bring that recommendation back to us okay. that includes. Okay, well, we, we would need to um, provide that information to the committee. I know Shauna is there, yeah. but we also received an email from um, DeLatry Hollinger sure. um, to, um, with clarification of what what the, ref the uh, preference was. And I'm sure that Shauna would be happy for it to happen that way as well. As I said to Autumn, well, you want to be able to drive and see it without having to stop and get out to do something to see it. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Commissioner Doge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, great update on this, Autumn. And um, I appreciate your comments, Commissioner williams Cox. I I'm going to be very interested to see what comes back from the committee because I think the interpretive boards around Cascades Park itself offer a lot more information. Um, I, I'm just really excited to see what they come back with. I'm glad they're being reactivated. There was an F a FAMU professor, and forgive me for not remembering his name at the moment, who was working on capturing the history of businesses along FAMU Way. Is FAMU engaged in this? Um, is there anyone within the committee that's working on that? or? Was that a separate project that you know of? Don't know. Okay. I, I, okay. That's just fine. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I, I was just curious because someone did outreach a couple years ago, but I didn't yeah. know if that project faded. So I think we're probably going to capture oh, a lot of the same um, material. There was a research paper that was written on the history of the FAMU area. Um, it looked at the businesses, uh, Alberta Crate. Yeah. and um, the neighborhoods and things like that. And that, that paper was finished, and that was, I think, Dr. Will Guzman. That sounds familiar, mm -hmm. yes. And he oh, was yes. on our uh, working group, but then he uh, relocated. Okay. So uh, actually, Ben and I went to family leadership. Was it, gosh, was it this week? It was earlier this week, yeah. Two days ago. And, um, and actually requested <laughs> of them. I know, it's a high <laughs> week. <laughs> <laughs> um, requested of them for some new 
the nominees for our, for our working group. That's wonderful. Well, I, I'm sure his research paper is going to be beneficial, and I remember talking to him, yes. so that, that's fantastic. Um, the only other two things, one is just a little random. I was at Lake Anita and met two young men skateboarding there who had driven from Georgia because we have probably Thomasville or something, we have better skateboarding areas than they do, so I actually mentioned the skatable art. You don't always get young 20-somethings thinking about public infrastructure, but they were excited. So anecdotally, that was just interesting. I hadn't never seen anyone skateboarding down there, so I'm really excited about these innovative ways we're looking at this. On the other hand, sometimes our innovations may need a second look, and I'm wondering if we have taken a second look at the back end parking. I know this may be a city issue, um, FAMUA and Gain Street, but I continue to hear questions about the back end parking. Some people are concerned about that, um, and whether it's additional signage. Um, we don't really have the parking on FAMUA filled out yet. I've only seen a few cars there, but they sometimes back in and sometimes do not. So whether it's additional signage or just reflecting on whether or not that's the best um, option for us in future projects, I'm wondering if we have looked at that or could look at that in the future. Okay. Sorry, I'm midway in M&M. &M. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. The, the Capital Cascades Trail is the uh, Blueprint IA project. Yeah. Family Way Extension is a city project, yeah. but well, we can share those comments with, uh, with the city. Thank you, Ben. I, I did think that was more of a city issue than a blueprint issue, but because we're doing more signage and other things, I thought I'd mention it here. Lastly, um, as a kid who went to a field trip at the wastewater treatment plant at um, Lake Bradford and Ducky Campbell. area, mm -hmm. it is pretty exceptional to see the plant demolished. It is standing out to a lot of people. <laughs> we've, we've, it is a urban area. We didn't need a treatment plant there, so well done to the city. I'm excited that that is moving, mm -hmm. and a lot of other people have noted it. So this is good progress for the south side. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, Commissioner williams Cox. I, too, have been asked questions about um, where does FAMU proper begin? Is it Gain, South Gaines Street, or is it at FAMU Way? The university? Yeah. Anybody have a... No, if I have a map of family. Yeah, I'm not loaded. Sure. Um, I know it jogs. No, it's not family. We can provide yeah. that, certainly. Yeah, we can. Okay, I, I just wanted to, because I'm getting feedback from the community as well, because things are looking good there. Mm. And so folks are just wondering, where does it really begin? Because uh, I've been told that through the years when Dr. Humphreys was there, there was uh, some type of um, border streets on the west, the uh, north, the south end on the east end, and so we were just asking where where is it now? Right, I'm sure FAMU has that too. There is defined. a defined area of the campus. I I think from well, I won't even say I won't even venture to guess, but I would think that the uh, north uh, uh, would would be Eugenia Street, and then going south that from would be even, from there. That would be, be a, but FAMU Way is on the other side of Eugenia. Mm -hmm. well, well, we'll get you that information. Okay. I don't even know official. why. Official. I, I want the to official so I can yes, speak yes, officially. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get you that information. Uh, ben? President uh, Robinson did mention two days ago, and I do not believe that the boundaries of FAMU go this far north, but a uh, point of pride for this group, that he is very proud of the abundant picture taking on the corner of Wanish oh, and FAMU Way absolutely. at the signage related to FAMU. Their, yeah, his entire executive team was, and and we do have uh, we do have the FAMU master plan, which I would imagine demarcates the boundaries of the university. So if we could, yes, sir, maybe we'll, get we'll a we'll copy that. of that. Yes, sir. To Everybody, the city has that. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Order. Carrying on. Okay. Oh, the the other thing I wanted to make sure that we uh, we do is when the committee meets. Uh, uh, to make well, I'm sure it'll be advertised, but make sure that uh, Mr. Hollinger has that information. So if he wants to attend the meeting and make that recommendation about the marker, uh, that he will have an opportunity to do that. Commissioner Maddox. I was just going to speak directly to my board. Does she need that informal motion, or was it just us saying that we like to see a motion? Please. Uh, I move that we um, okay. direct. 
the IA uh, staff to consider the concept of honoring Dr. Smith through the HCT project. That's a motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Dozier. Uh, motion by <laughs> Commissioner Maddox. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. So that's the direction from the board. Thank you. I Thank you, Order. Okay, um, moving on to the Northeast Gateway uh, Wolani Boulevard project. We've reached our first milestone in this project, um, particularly as it rates, relates to our project development environment study or our PD&E study, which is the public kickoff meeting on March 11th at Holy Comforter School. The intent of the meeting is to provide information about the purpose of the study and receive initial feedback from the community about Wolani Boulevard. The study will result in the approximate location of the Five Mile Wolani Boulevard corridor. To determine this siting, we are looking to balance transportation needs with safety, environmental impacts, and social and cultural impacts such as neighborhood concerns and historic resources. The study will wrap up by the summer of 2020, at which point we'll move into design. The next two project updates will be presented by Megan Doherty, Principal Planner at Blueprint. As you recall, at the last IA board meeting, 300,000 was approved to implement temporary improvements on the future Star Metro Superstop site. And her project update provides a status on that. Uh, but first, thank you to our city and county partners uh, for helping us to get the site cleaned up um, and also helping with safety out there while we work on our design on permitting and, and moving into construction. Autumn, did you say cleaned up? Yes, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't say cleaned up. <laughs> well, well, I, I drive by there a lot. It is looking better. Um, I thought I saw that some treatment or something had been put on the ground. It looked like some grass or something right. is growing. Yeah. And it looks like the water, either due to lack of rain or the water is not settling there. I am concerned, though, because there's um, uh, entrepreneurship yeah. occurring even after dark because someone has <laughs> figured out how to light, light a spot. So just, you know... Uh, it is. I mean, it's legitimate. It's legitimate business. It's not, yeah. it's not illegal business taking place. We People think. there are selling food and doing what you know, whatever. <laughs> but um, I drove out there the other night, and it was just, it was dark. But they were still making money. Yeah. So. And Autumn, there, uh, I read somewhere where they said there are bathrooms that have already been installed. And I specifically, look, I was there. I did an interview with Channel 6 on the site, and I didn't see bathrooms. And that, that is one of the things that has really concerned me. I mean, because that, that lot is heavily used. And people are there from the time I come by there in the morning taking my daughter to school until late at night. And somebody's using the bathroom somewhere, and it ain't at the King store. Right. Local and businesses. So I'm really <laughs> concerned about that aspect of it. But I, like I said, I read somewhere where the bath, it said bathrooms have been installed. Yeah, Mr. Chairman? Page 96. Okay, thank you. Just a, a couple of words, um, and I think some of this will be uh, addressed in the presentation okay. about to, okay. to be given. Well, I guess we. I, 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 but I do want to acknowledge straight away, just as we thank county and city staff for their assistance on this. This is a cleanup in progress. That's right. part one. Part two, uh, we appreciated the direction provided at the last IA meeting to allocate three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars toward this. We understand the sense of urgency uh, and the importance of this project, yes. and so I uh, just wanted to uh, thank you for those comments and, okay. and Let's convey go ahead that with the presentation. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Autumn, and thank you, Commissioners. We're pleased to share with you the updated concept for the Orange Meridian site, which incorporates the additional direction that you provided at the December meeting. We're excited about the opportunity these changes provide to create a more people-friendly space that supports the current uses on the site. Um, on the screen before you, you can see the updated concept. It's in your packet as well. Um, and it reflects that the green space has been expanded to provide a larger area for those community uses. And in coordination with our partners at Leon County, a temporary restroom facility will be installed okay. on the site. Um, the facility will be maintained and operated consistent with those restroom facilities at existing Leon County sites. Okay. And the restroom and green space will be accessible via an ADA accessible walkway from Orange Avenue, um, and we've also added two ADA accessible site uh, parking spaces to the site. The project will also include the enhancement of the existing sidewalks along Orange Avenue and Meridian Street. We'll be enhancing those sidewalks to improve the aesthetics as well as safety. 
and we'll also be adding lights to the existing poles on the north side of Polk Drive. Both of these changes accomplish the goal of improving the site um, prior to the construction of that Star Metro Superstop site without constraining um, the site as Star Metro continues to work through that design process as they're doing right now. Sure. Next slide, please. So Blueprint has been coordinating with Leon County as they have completed the initial site cleanup. The image on the left shows the site conditions last December and the image on the right um, shows the current site conditions today. Since January, Leon County Public Works has trimmed the trees to improve visibility on the site and also removed the significant amount of asphalt slabs you can see on that image on the left there um, that had been uh, dumped on the site. Additionally, dirt and gravel has been um, added to the site to address some of those areas of standing water. Um, so hopefully a lot of that will be reduced. Um, lastly, to help manage the debris on site, we've been working with the Florida Food Ministry who uses the site as a weekly distribution point as well as those on-site food vendors to help manage that debris. We've installed additional trash cans, and we've also worked with the Leon County Office of Resource Stewardship um, to uh, maintain the site multiple times throughout the week and pick up that debris. So the image on the right shows that the progress is, uh, that has been made, but more improvements are coming. Uh, currently, we've already retained a consultant and are working through the design process and permitting for the green space, uh, the community use, or the community amenities, in the parking that you saw in the concept plan. <laughs> Moving forward, we'll continue to work closely with our partners at the city and the county to expedite these improvements for the community's benefit, and we look forward to sharing the continued progress with you. Next slide, please. Today, we're also providing an update on the funding schedule for the Capital Circle Southwest project. Oh, As you may remember, this before is Before you go, can I oh, ask sorry? A, yes. a quick question? If, and Either you or if Ben, you have it. Sure. So, so when, when these improvements are made, because I'm really concerned about what will happen after the, the improvements are made, who, who will maintain the lot? I know it's county property, but who will specifically be responsible for maintaining uh, that area once these improvements? Well, even now, but certainly once the improvements are made. Right. Um, so until the property is conveyed to Blueprint for the purpose of the super stop and other Blueprint-related permanent um, <coughs> construction, it will be maintained by the county. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ben. Yes, sir. Okay. You can continue Thank presentation. Thank you. Um, so today we're also providing an update on the Capital Circle Southwest project and specifically the funding schedule um, for this project, which is the last segment of the Capital Circle corridor to be completed. Um, in April 2015, this board identified the Capital Circle Southwest project as the number one priority for the Blueprint 2020 program. Uh, once completed, it's anticipated that FDOT funding for this project will exceed $115 million, making Capital Circle Southwest the, large, the largest leveraging success in the history of the Blueprint program. So recently, FDOT published their draft five-year work program, and it included some changes to the funding schedule we wanted to be sure to highlight for you today. Um, for the segment from Spring Hill Road to Orange Avenue, which is a segment um, right there in front of the airport, funding for construction has been moved from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. And for the segment from Crawfordville to Spring Hill Road, funding has been moved from fiscal year 2022 to 2024. Um, we regularly at Blueprint, we communicate uh, with the FDOT District 3 leadership and it's important to note that the funding amounts for these projects have not changed, and we still anticipate that FDOT will fully fund the construction of this project. Um, lastly, based on the previous funding schedule provided, Blueprint had identified funding for enhanced roadway lighting across both segments in our um, capital budget. And so if this needs to change in the future due to the FDOT funding schedule changes, we'll be sure to bring that back to you for further consideration and direction. And now back to Autumn. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I've got yeah. Okay, you got more auto? Okay. Yeah, wrapping Continue. it up. Um, as you've heard today, we have a significant amount of work beginning in the next six months. Looking ahead to the anticipated new work, we have 11 projects in or going into procurement, and many we touched on today. One worth highlighting on this list is the existing conditions survey work on Airport Gateway. The fiscal year 2019 budget includes a million dollars to begin the initial phases for this project. The survey work will provide existing conditions data on the right-of-way, underground and above-ground utilities and environmental features. 
Doing this phase now helps us to meet our project timelines as we bring the Southwest Area Transportation Plan to a close. And this data will provide more accurate information to the public once the airport gateway project is formally initiated and the public engagement begins later this year. We took these 11 projects and laid them on a map to show the geographic distribution across the county. And when you add, we also added in the projects that are already active. You can see that we're involved in many areas of the community and these projects include many project types. As we move into and through these projects, we're committed to our practice of innovative and successful public engagement. And we look forward to bringing future updates to you and appreciate the direction and leadership that you provide to help us build great public spaces. Thank you. Um, Autumn, the, the one question that I have, and, and I, I just have not been able to get, uh, <laughs> I guess, a straight answer one way or the other, but when, when I moved into my house, which is just off of Orange Avenue, 22 years ago, um, th there was property on either side of Orange Avenue and it was going to be developed and we worked out a deal to abate the, develop the uh, housing development that was proposed, but, but even the city back then told us, because the city owns the property on the north side of Orange Avenue from, uh, gosh, it's hard to, there's a park. Uh, mm. Edwina Stevens Park, right there on, on Orange Avenue. The city owns that property. We were told even then that that property was being acquired by the city in anticipation of the widening of Orange Avenue. And since I've been on this commission and a part of Blueprint, uh, you know, we've talked about the widening of Orange Avenue and I, I had a conversation with Greg uh, Slay, our CRTPA director, just recently, and now he's telling me it could be another five to 10 years before we widen Orange Avenue. I know they're doing the PD&E study now, but I, I just wanna, uh, because my neighbors are asking me, my pastor has asked me, you know, we attend Bethel AME Church there on Orange Avenue, and, and I keep telling them different answers based on the different information that I'm given as this thing has progressed since 22 years ago. So could I get sort of a straight answer on where we are with the widening, because it also was included in discussions about the, the um, Gateway Project uh, and how Orange Avenue would be widened from Capitol Circle to South Adams or South Monroe Street. Yeah, I, I, I hopefully I can give you a straight answer. Um, okay. And I, I definitely endeavor to. Uh, so, um, Orange Avenue being this portion of Orange Avenue mm -hmm. that, that is the blueprint project being on a state road, right? Mm -hmm. And when uh, we did our prioritization for our big regional mobility projects, we aligned our um, prioritization up with the funding stream from DOT so that we could leverage the DOT funding on the state roads as closely as possible. Okay. So working with CRTPA and Greg. So, um, my message will be the same as Greg's okay. in terms of waiting for DOT funding to come along. Now, they have not identified funding for construction for the widening of Orange Avenue. Okay. Um, they, they are working on that pd &E now, which is a great first start. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll continue to pressure, because of it being a blueprint project, to get that funding as soon as possible, knowing the need right. to widen Orange Avenue. Okay, so what could we be looking at from a timing perspective at this point? Same answer as Greg Slay, that probably that eight to 10 year window wow. for construction finishment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and the reason I'm pushing this is because traffic on Orange Avenue is yeah. horrendous, especially on FSU game days because they reroute traffic from the stadium to Orange Avenue. And it's almost impossible to get in and out from either side when all that traffic you know, is backed up on Orange Avenue. It's 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 an issue. Mm -hmm. So, okay. All yeah, right. Quick question on the um, Commissioner Deloge. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Kim. Kim. Mm -hmm. uh, on the Walani on the Northeast Gateway, um, at Westminster has played a very interesting role as far as Dempsey Mayo. They're just right down the street down there. I'm just curious if you had any conversations with them about what it's going to look like on the Fleischman end of it. Is that they they they're active and they're out there and I just want to make sure we kind of try and communicate with them as best we can. Mary, 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're actually, um, we have identified some of our key stakeholders in Westminster being one of those, um, reaching out to them to try to have one-on-ones um, to listen to their concerns. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Past, past Commissioner Marjorie Turnbull has been really active in that process, which is good, and yeah. it's nice, and they're good, it's good input from oh, the yeah. residents. They're all real engaged. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good. Did you have more? Uh, no, I'm done. Thank okay. You. Do we... Please, is there yeah. a motion to accept? Well, I, or Mr. Williams, question. Did, did you have a comment on that item? I want to just say, uh, great job, thank you. It, is it possible for us to receive these this presentation? Because it's not in our packet. I'm a hands-on learner. I need to be able to write on it. Um, so if you could provide it to us, um, either email it to us. And I don't know how far in advance you have your presentation ready, if it's ready before the briefings, or if it's ready you know, when you give us this. But if, if you do have presentations that are already ready, it would be great to have those ahead of time so that we have time to kind of study and, and see it close up without just seeing it for the first time sure. popped up. And, and uh, Commissioner Williams-Cox, you, you all have, have you know, we, we've been here and, you know, we just go with the flow because we know, it, but you all have made a, an excellent point. And so, Ben, in the future, um, presentations, briefings, uh, uh, policy changes as you've gotten direction from our new members. Uh, if you just keep that in mind as we go forward until they are where we are yes, fair enough. at yes, this sir. point. You know, we kind of just take it for granted because we've been here, but your point is very well taken. That's why you need new blood. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Move up. <laughs> let, me, let me take another yes, comment sir. from I just had Mr. a uh, um, Similar to the Orange Avenue question, just the prioritization list, because um, as I mentioned, um, I've gotten several phone calls about Tharp Street and sidewalks and the danger there. And then our last CRTPA meeting, they presented some traffic statistics there that yeah. that weren't weren't impressive, I guess, to, say, <laughs> to put it nicely. Uh, but I was just wondering um, when we're ranking, or I guess specifically um, where that project was ranked and when um, the bonding discussion happened, it seemed Vanderman Road got moved ahead of Tharp Street. And I was just wondering the rationale between that and whether there was a traffic study <laughs> comparison or um, to look at on that project. You happen to have the answer to that? I, I do. Okay. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, it, it's just, it's in line with the same answer with um, Orange Avenue in the sense that um, our large regional mobility projects, which both Orange Avenue and Tharp Street are a part of, um, also Bannerman and Pensacola, um, and uh, in, in North Monroe, but they, we aligned those projects with the CRTPA's um, regional mobility plan, which was that very clear and consistent message to DOT about what our local priorities and for improving our roadways. Um, the CRTPA does their <coughs> regional mobility plan update every five years, and it's, a, um, it's usually a two-year process of looking at a lot of different factors for how to develop that list of priorities. Um, one of the criticisms that we'd gotten over the years from DOT was that we had a um, inconsistent set of priorities coming to them. Mm -hmm. So they were like, you guys need to tell us, give us one list, and that'll help you to get the best chance of getting as much of our funding to go onto the roads. So that was part of our, um, that was our strategy, really, for, for how we ranked those regional mobility plans, was aligning it with the CRTPA. Commissioner okay. Matlow. Was the... Um, was the Tharp Street project ranked ahead of Bannerman before the bonding conversation? Um, uh, no, sir. Okay. Bannerman was ahead of Tharp Street in the in the in, in the priorities. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you, mm -hmm. Commissioner Bryant. Did you have a? No. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? I'll move that to one. Second. Okay. Uh, move motion by Commissioner Lindley to uh, approve option one, seconded by Commissioner Matlow. Uh, Matt Lowe, Maddox, I'm sorry. Uh, is, are there any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Autumn. You did an excellent job. We appreciate that. Uh, that brings us to item number nine, acceptance of the status report on the operations of the Tallahassee Leon County OEV. Mr. Chairman, happy to turn it over to Director Paredes to walk us through some of the exciting things that have been happening in, in the uh, space of economic vitality. Thank you very much, and thank you, Commissioners. I'm excited to be here with you today and update you on our activities since our last meeting in December. 
Um, as you know, our vision is to elevate, promote, and support our diverse and vibrant economy, and that's guided through our mission statement to work with our private sector and community stakeholders to assist businesses in navigating and competing in today's marketplace. We utilize, um, we trace all of our work back to our six cornerstones and three cross-cutting strategies and identify in each agenda item where um, we are making progress in those areas. Our targeted industries are applied science and manufacturing, professional services, and healthcare. We'll focus on the top two in a, in a separate update as we update you on those strategic efforts to maximize our world-class resources and where we're economically competitive. Um, our, we couldn't do any of this work without our collaborators, and many of our partners are listed here on the screen. We work closely with all our business leaders and, and small minority women businesses every day to help build that vibrant and diverse economy that we have here. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome to our team Richard Fetchik. He was formerly with the Appalachia Regional Planning Council as the Director for Economic Development there. He also has an entrepreneurial background and he's utilizing that background when he comes in and takes a look at all the, our 85 indicators that we have. Today he's gonna walk you through an update of your first quarter economic indicator report, which is also at your desk. And I'm pleased and to have and happy to turn it over to Richard. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, and good afternoon, commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'll start with some of the highlights from our economic dashboard. As you know, the Office of Economic Vitality collects statistics in a wide variety of areas, and our dashboard publishes 13 of those top indicators. <coughs> What we see here on the sidebar is that median single family home sales are at $214,500 at a, a median, which is down one half of a percent from the previous quarter, but it is up 5.7% year over year. Second, uh, we note that Tallahassee International Airport has seen 219,177 passengers for the 2018 year and that's up 11.8% over the last quarter, as well as 5.5% year over year. So there is growing numbers of persons traveling through our airport. On the right-hand pane there, we take a slightly deeper dive, and this uh, quarterly focus looks at homestead properties, which is a key source of residential capital accumulation. We are back to pre-recession levels for the value of the improvements on land. The land is the uh, gold area to the bottom and the turquoise area shows how it dipped and has recovered. The uh, value per square foot is at 95% of those pre-recession levels. However, the total gross value exceeds it. Another breakout that we can examine are employment conditions. So here we're comparing to the state and the nation, and uh, we tack very closely to the state in most areas that are at this macro level. So uh, job growth has been 2.6% as of 2018 December year over year, and then we actually exceed the state growth rate for private sector uh, growth, and that's at 4.4%. If we look at the unemployment rate, again, we're very similar to the uh, Florida levels, which are uh, 10 basis points below us, but again, very similar. Mm -hmm. And our sectors that we're excelling at are leisure and hospitality and business and professional services, which reflect what we tend to inaugurate locally. As far as trend lines go, uh, how are things changing on a multiple year basis again compared to the, the state and the nation? Well, it looks quite similar. Although our highs are less pronounced and our, our lows usually are too, so we're, we're buffered in that respect. Um, when the state unemployment rate crossed 11% in 2009, 2010, we remained closer to eight. And then like we showed numerically in the last slide, we're down to around 3% right now. So the economy continues to be fairly prosperous on those macro indicators. Another indicator that I'll, that I'll break out and wanted to, to point to are all uh, bands of permits for dwelling units. So uh, 
we're not only looking at single family residential, but also multifamily. And from this, you can see that while levels aren't necessarily equivalent to those pre-recession levels, our multifamily category, which is sort of the dark blue there, uh, has experienced an uptick. And this is likely due to the student housing that's occurring around Gaines Street and the environs of FAMU and FSU. So that is another measure by which we are supplying new housing. Yes, Commissioner Dozier. Richard, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Quick question on that. Mm -hmm. Is there any data that helps us break out student housing versus multifamily? I hadn't thought of, this graph is fascinating going back to 1970, but as we talk about affordable housing, I just wonder it might be interesting to see the um, student housing versus the rest, is, or we might not have that data. I think it's an excellent question, and um, as it, it may exist, and I have uh, not put my finger on it yet, so to speak. We're happy to look into those questions because I think it's a pertinent area. I, I just think for other work city and county might do on affordable, um, that question stands out, so thank you. Certainly, thank you. Another way in which we produce information that helps us to compare ourselves to other trends is our competitiveness report, which again was presented at the, the last meeting and I just wanted to give a nod to. This is whereby we uh, are able to measure ourselves against peer communities from Trenton, New Jersey to Gainesville and the other 11 members of that list. Uh, there is a lot of data that informs it. It gets standardized. And then as you can see, that, that right uh, portrait style panel gives our score in relation to the other communities. And in uh, the business vitality index, for example, Tallahassee does quite well compared to its peers. And that covers uh, statistics such as industrial diversity, occupational diversity, and um, wages per job and GDP per capita. So to, to recap, again, it's exciting to be here. And I, I think that the intelligence EIQ lab is operating at a high level of service. We have many, many, many indicators at the disposal of our commissioners and our businesses and residents. And as we move forward, what I'm looking to do to help us perform at an even higher level is to work with our community counterparts, stakeholders, businesses, and uh, other partners in order to focus these indicators on what really matters for job growth, wage growth, and business revenue growth. Number two, uh, we want to continue to provide our, our key stakeholders with the benchmarking information on our peer communities that help us to locate where we can improve performance. And three, internally, uh, we are working on systems whereby we can measure our performance at meeting the goals of OEB, which Christina presented on. Thank you, Richard. At our last meeting, we um, updated you on the active projects that um, our office is working on. Um, since then, we've seen a 20% increase, so we moved from 13 active projects to 20. The majority of these are within manufacturing and advanced manufacturing more specifically, and within applied sciences. As you can see, most of our projects are coming in through partner referrals, and those are th things that when we reach out to our partners and collaborators, they're um, referring them back to our office for assistance. Um, our, one of our fastest growing industries, I wanted to take a moment to point this out um, to you. Last year when this data was um, developed the, by the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, manufacturing did not show up in this top list. Um, you can see here in their updated data that that is shown as one of our fastest growing industry. And this reinforces what we've seen in our 2018 targeted industry study that manufacturing has a future here in Tallahassee, Leon County. And that's because it's tied with those opportunities for our knowledge, assets, and innovation. So that's where that applied science piece comes in. Applied science, magnetic technologies, high performance materials, coupled with that advanced manufacturing is what, may, is what, is what our community is ripe and ed economically competitive in. And you'll see that um, later on in our presentation or under item number 10. 
our fastest growing occupations. I wanted to take a look back before we took a look forward. In 2017, you see a, um, a lot of healthcare in here. You see nurse practitioners, surgeons, as well as some skilled areas within the medical profession. When you move into 2018 fastest growing occupations, you're starting to see those skilled careers that we're hearing a lot about that need for in that construction area, HVAC, plumbers, <laughs> tile and marble setters. And probably the most interesting one to me was the butchers and meat cutters. <laughs> so I picked up the phone and called our new Greenwise Publix and said, hey, talk to me about your need for butchers and meat cutters. And we had a long conversation about how he has trouble getting talent specifically in that area. So that was something really neat that popped out and had a great conversation with one of our new local businesses and how they're reaching out for that talent. I did take the opportunity to invite them to the Leon Works Expo and um, those fastest growing occupations clearly show the need to work with our high schools to help them understand what careers exist for them um, without needing that two year degree. So we're really excited. It's, we're a week and one day away, so eight days away from the Leon Works Expo. We're really looking forward to that. Um, I think right now we have 130 <coughs> exhibitors scheduled to be there. Over 550 students from Wakulla, Gadsden, and Leon County will be present. And then afterwards, we're gonna take the opportunity to meet with the employers who and, and exhibitors to talk to them about <coughs> strategies to help them with, with the multi-generations that are in their workforce or in their workplace. We're seeing four generations in the workplace right now, so how best can you bridge those multi-generational gaps? Um, this right here is coupled really nicely with that map Autumn showed you too. When you look at wh who's coming into our design work studio, where the penny sales tax and major developments are, and those blueprint projects that Autumn just showed you here, what does that mean when you layer a federally designated opportunity zone on top of that? So on March 14th, we're really excited to partner with a, um, with a local consulting group, um, with a former Department of Edu um, op Economic Opportunity employees who did and specialized work within Opportunity Zones to talk with our community um, investors de and developers on um, how they can leverage these Opportunity Zone workshops and what public sector um, projects are already scheduled to occur in these areas over the next five to seven years. Um, our goals of these zones um, support city and county priorities and align with our strategic plan to create diverse jobs, catalyze redevelopment, and promote economic inclusion. We've also, under our new um, IQ Lab and under Richard's direction, we created a, or creating a GIS dashboard for Opportunity Zones, where you can see the daytime population the average median in, or the median income for this area, the median age, as well as the major development scheduled to come online and public sector projects. So this, um, this will be available for you to view on our website and our dashboard. We're also developing a book to help educate um, anybody that's interested in developing in these areas. We're looking forward to that workshop and hope that you will join us for that conversation. We open registration on Monday, and at the close of the day on Monday, we already had 40 people registered, so we're really excited. Um, and here's a list of our other upcoming events um, for the next quarter that we have scheduled right now. Um, of note is May 6th through 11th, that's our International Economic Development and Small Business Week. We're currently developing an agenda for that week and hope that you'll help celebrate our diverse um, and vibrant economy with us. With that, I'd like to ask Daryl Jones, our Deputy Director from Minority Women and Small Businesses, to come to the podium and give us a report on um, in, in his area. Mr. Chair, uh, before we move on to the next section, Christine, would Reiner. you mind going back to one of the uh, fastest growing industry slides? Yes. <coughs> I know that's uh, Florida DEO data, so it's statewide data, but what exactly does that mean? Does that mean, are those, is that demand for occupations? It doesn't necessarily mean that those jobs will be filled, correct? That is the they fastest can't. growing industry <clears throat> in, ta in Leon County, coming from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. It's based on their labor market information and Florida employment projections. So it's future projected need, yes. not necessarily filled positions. Yes. Great, all right, thanks. You're and, welcome. And also, uh, 
Christine, as you all know, I'm, I'm working at Lively now, and what I'm telling people everywhere I go is that the jobs are here in Leon County and in this area. What's lacking are those individuals to take those jobs. We're talking about a workforce now that's average age 55, 60. They're getting ready to retire, and we don't have a bench to become the plumbers and roofers and electricians, uh, 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 nursing assistants, medical assistants, pharmacy tech, heavy equipment operators. That's where the issue is. And so we as a community, uh, as a region, I believe, are going to have to have that kind of conversation of how do we encourage these kids to go into those training programs that we have at Lively, where in a year they can become a uh, a, a welder and make $125,000 a year. We've got students right now in Augusta, Georgia, finishing an apprenticeship in welding. They're making $125,000 a year. Uh, we can't train nursing assistants and medical assistants fast enough for the industry right here in Tallahassee, that, that these kids are being scooped up as soon as they get that state certificate uh, and making good money with benefits. And so it, we, we haven't started to talk about it broadly as a community, maybe as a region, but that's where the next conversation is gonna have to go. Uh, or we're gonna find ourselves in a whole heap of trouble, as they say. Even, even with what has happened with, with Hurricane Michael and the devastation in the Panhandle, so many of our trades people have headed west because that's where they're making the money now, and they're writing their own paycheck, essentially. You know, I'm trying to get my roof replaced, and I'm having contractors tell me that, I had, a guy, I, I had just asked him for a quote, and he said, Mr. Richardson, I can come and give you a quote. He said, I've got 27 projects ahead of you. I might be able to get to you in three or four months. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's and, and I'm talking to contractors who are saying, you know, Mr. Richardson, we can hire them if they're out there. We, we need them. So the jobs are there. We've got to match the students with the training and skills that are needed, not only the, the, the employment skills, but what we call the soft skills. You know, you show up to work on time. You know, you dress appropriately, and you, you know how to interact with people. Those are, that is the kind of training that, that these individuals need, both student, uh, young people and, and adults, to make them ready uh, for the jobs that are out there. The jobs are there. We've just, we've just got to get them prepared and, and into that workforce. Mr. Commissioner Lindley. I, I just feel compelled to weigh in on this because when we started Leon Works in 2015, yes. that is when we really, uh, as a county, started seeing this mm -hmm. incredible need, which has only gotten worse. Yes. You do know Leon Works now uh, has is in cooperation with three counties, right. West Wakala and Gus, <clears throat> and soft skills are a big part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we are working with the schools. We're working also with, with uh, in apprenticeship programs, and we have gotten money right. from the state legislature <coughs> to assist with that. So we know the business community needs to get involved in the apprenticeship mm -hmm. part. It's not that kind of training is as important as... Um, or it's equally important, uh, and that is a big piece that's still a tough one mm -hmm. because businesses are so busy putting the roofs on that they don't have time to right. create an apprenticeship program. And, but, and it's chronic, but the state legislature is very interested in this. I mean, everyone, I like to say, has joined the Leon, uh, Leon County and City of Tallahassee efforts. And Christina really got this thing organized about four years ago. Yeah. Have you and, and it was interesting that, that both gubernatorial candidates, the one thing they agreed on, <laughs> the only thing probably, but they both ran on this whole notion of career and technical education in the state of Florida, and the legislature is moving forward on that. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a priority issue, both of the governor's office and the legislature. Well, I think uh, the school district, too, has been oh, a oh, great yeah. partner in yeah. this because there has had to be a really big shift from um, people, students feeling that uh, college track was all they right. all they should aspire to, and it just simply isn't the case for something like 60% of high school graduates mm -hmm. don't go on to a four-year right. degree. You're so, right. Daryl, we thank you for the school district participation. It's, it's sure. essential. Yeah. 
So wherever we can, even outside of Leon Works, which is tremendous, I mean, we're expecting hundreds of, of, of uh, high school students and others to that event. That's the kind of conversation we're gonna have to have on a daily basis with not only the students, but their parents. What, what I'm finding uh, uh, is that parents are the biggest obstacle because everybody wants to think that their child needs to go to college and get a two-year degree or a four-year degree or a PhD. And we've got college graduates coming back now to Lively to get career and technical training so they can pay off those doggone student loans that <laughs> <laughs> they've acquired getting that degree in English or sociology and Watch I don't have anything about wrong with the, you know, the English or sociology Be majors. Be careful. Major right there. I'm sociology and Daryl's uh, uh -oh. English. So. Uh -oh. Well, I was psychology, so I, I'm, I'm in that same boat. So are we, are we too old to um, go back for that training so we can make that $125,000 no, a year? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> $125,000 a year? A year. Can you train commissioners? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, limit, but anyway, <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Any other comments or questions on that issue? Okay. Well, thank you. I, I'm Joe. always delighted to come and talk to the IA, particularly about the work that we're doing um, in the Minority Women and Small Business Enterprise Program. I want you to know that we are constantly uh, working to ensure that our certification has the greatest value possible for our certified <coughs> WSBEs. To that end, we're also in conversations with our principal stakeholders. And of course, those conversations include our certified MWSBEs. Then it also includes those prime contractors who count on our certified MWSBEs to meet their uh, aspirational target goals through subcontracting. And then our newest stakeholder are those persons by your direction who now hold MOUs with our office as well, like TMH the Tallahassee Housing Authority, FAMU, and the Leon County Sheriff's Office. So in those conversations, and because we've been listening to them, here in our second year of industry academies, they told us what they really wanted us to offer, and so that subsequently informed our choices. So we have risk management in partnership with Brown & Brown, construction bonding so they can build capacity, succession planning is something that came to us most specifically from our MWSBE Citizens Advisory Committee, business financing and microloans, and because Ajax Construction, one of our principal uh, businesses here in town is doing work both with the city and at Florida a and University. We're going to provide a special course in cooperation with them so that our subcontractors can know how to use the construction software required for, to work with Ajax. We've been listening to them, so subsequently after we have each one of these sessions, we're going to make certain that we record them and then be able to share them for a lifetime as we create what will be an OEV YouTube channel. So now we'll take those those uh, courses, and now they'll be available for everyone beyond the date of those activities as webinars. Listening again to our stakeholders, many of you may recall the former matchmaker program that was offered through the Office of Supplier and Diversity of the state of Florida. So what we did was we, we're gonna retool that same idea with our MW, uh, SB to b business to business connection forums. And what we're doing was we identified principal areas where we have certified MWSBEs, most specifically in public relations, construction, uh, professional services, and architecture and engineering. And so what we've found out is that when we, were, if we bring those primes along with those subcontractors who hold our certification, we all know that in responding and making certain that we have the best type of responses is based upon relationships. We want to take the, beyond the static notion of going to our database by virtue of relationships made possible through this program, we will have those types of relationships for our primes and our subcontractors. One of the things that we talked about when we first consolidated was that, again, we wanted our certification to have value. We get that value through our four E's, engagement, education, equipping, and the empowerment of our, of our certified MWSBEs. We now have a certification workshop that we now offer monthly so that those persons with whom we currently hold MOUs as well as the city of Tallahassee, Leon County Schools, uh, and uh, CareerSource, 
we bring our certified MWSBEs together and we work with them directly so they can identify procurement opportunities, help them with their bid responses, and help them to make certain that they're certified in our program and certified with our collaborative partner uh, programs as well. So we're seeing, so now it is our hope, particularly with our, our colleague Richard Fetchick, we want to be able to quantify what success looks like. What is the genuine impact of this certification that has value? So we're going to create our own scorecard that will be able to, that we'll, so we'll be able to provide you with additional information about the impacts of these activities that we're doing. It's, it's important to note here, commissioners, that this was a conversation that we had significantly with our Economic Vitality Leadership Council a couple of weeks ago when we had that meeting, how we measure our impact and our scorecards within each one of our activities. So we're working together as a team to bring those to you so that you can see where our office is making those impacts and keeping score. That's right. Um, our next up is our disparity study. As you know, at your direction, we will bring that disparity study back to you uh, for your full consideration at our June IA meeting. <coughs> we'll receive that disparity study uh, tomorrow, starting immediately next week. We'll convene a work group also at your direction that includes both legal, finance, and procurement professionals from both the city, the county, and Blueprint. Together, we will work through, as the kids say, we will chop it up and be able to be prepared to bring you the best disparity possible. One of the things that we're very pleased with with our vendor, MGT of America, is that they've done a great job of making certain that this disparity study is a genuine reflection of the width and breadth of what we describe as our business ecosystem. So engagement has been at a premium with them. As you look at each page, we talk about the citizens advisory committees that they have met with, the community meetings and public partnerships. Also, we have a list of the 12 stakeholder interviews that they have had. We've also talked about the types of direct contact that they've had with business owners through in-depth interviews, uh, surveys, telephone calls, all in an effort to make certain that this disparity study is a genuine reflection of what this community needs and the term types of engagement that they currently have with our certified MWSBs so that we can make sure that our disparity study has the biggest bang for our buck. Finally, we have our calendar that I'd like to share with you of how we're going to land the disparity study. Again, we're going to get that disparity study on tomorrow. Then beyond that, we'll have four to three separate work groups. We'll then have a finalized draft report that we'll be able to prepare, that we'll be prepared to deliver to you at your June meeting. So thank you for your support and thank you uh, for this opportunity to share our activities. Carol, would you, uh, before you leave the podium. Yes, sir. Uh, well, let me ask, is everybody aware, every, because we want to make sure everybody's up to speed, aware of what the disparity study is and the reasoning for that? Disparity study? Okay, everybody's okay with that? Okay. Commissioner Dozier, I just wanted to make sure everybody was up to speed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, General. Great presentation. I like the scorecard approach for all the different uh, areas of OEV. I am so thrilled you mentioned succession planning. Um, certainly in the construction industry, that is a really big issue. Um, not all Family business, I mean, people have family who follow them into the business. Um, some of our longest serving businesses in the community, I don't count uh, the business I worked at a long time ago, but a lot of others, it is the children of those principals who come into the business. Mm -hmm. But we, it, it is a struggle to have a succession plan. So I'm really thrilled you, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. There is another piece, and I'm not sure this is as necessary right now given the workforce constraints. But um, a skilled labor or tradesman wanting to branch out on their own and become a contractor or a subcontractor, bridging that divide, they may have the skills but may not think about the, the bookkeeping aspects, the legal requirements, becoming a sole proprietor, those types of things. I just wanted to put that out there because those two bookends of that industry but also others that we talk about with um, mm -hmm. the non-four-year degree particularly or any small business um, seem to be real stumbling points. So again, I'm glad you're focused on succession. That may be more critical piece now, but I'd love to see if there was a toolkit for becoming a business if you've been working in one for a while um, in the future. Uh, that is something that comes up often. So 
Does that resonate with it what you've does. heard from the committee and others? If I, if I may, I, yeah. it, it does a great deal. Um, I, I'd have to, if I may, I want to acknowledge the team. Uh, Shanae Wilkes and Latanya uh, Raffington, between the both of them, we have close to 30 <laughs> years of experience in supplier diversity. The succession planning was a part of one of the things that they've seen as we deal with certification and recertification of our businesses. Because we do the types of on-site visits, you know, as a part of that, we're seeing this as a growing trend. Uh, businesses that have, a, persons that have a business, the family doesn't want to be involved, but they want to hold on to the value of their business. So that's why we thought this course was so important. And as it relates to entrepreneurship opportunities for persons who transition from the workforce, mm -hmm. one of the things that we're now requiring is that any business that engages with us to certify, we're also requiring that they also participate with the FAMU Small Business Development Center. That business plan development, as you already know, is an important roadmap for any beginning business. So if we require that, that they go through this worthwhile program that helps them with financing, long-term goals and planning, uh, that's time well spent. So that's one of the ways that we are, we're able to meet that workforce interest in starting their own business. That's, that is fantastic. I'm excited about the progress, so thank you. And just lastly, I had written a note about the um, Jim Rand Institute, I think, their peer-to-peer -peer group, mm -hmm. just before you mentioned the business of business. So you, you answered that question immediately, so I'm really excited about that one as well. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Carol? Mr. Maddox? Mr. Chair, I just want to make a mm -hmm. uh, comment and say good, great job, been very innovative. What you've done here is, is indicative of what you've done since you've been in the position, which is bringing innovation to what we're trying to create here with our MWSB program. We're very proud to have it, very proud of you, what you and your staff is doing uh, to create value there. And with that, Mr. Chair, I want to move option one. Uh, there's a motion uh, by Commissioner Maddox to accept option one uh, on the recommendation from staff and seconded by Commissioner Lindley. Are there any additional questions? Or well, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one thing at the December meeting, I just want to kind of uh, revisit, this, revisit this real quickly. I, I spoke with Ben about it during our briefing earlier. Um, during the um, MWS, NWSBE work, I, I asked about um, um, doing some per capita comparisons of Tallahassee's progress with other cities. You know, it's, it's, it's really important for us to measure our progress relative to ourselves from the past, but it's equally important for us to measure ourselves against our peer cities and counties. And I, I know Ben and, and Christina and, and Mr. Jones are, are working on that, but I just want to kind of remind everybody that's something I really would like to see. Sure. We can be doing really great relative to our, to our past, but I want to know how we're doing relative to other cities, too. Okay. We'll make sure we have that information for you by the next meeting. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair? Commissioner Dozier? I'm sorry, I had uh, two other quick things. I can save okay. this to, for an agenda, but I think they're more pertinent to OEV's report. Okay. Um, Go right ahead. So, in general, I can say the same thing. Oh, yes, let me sir. carry the motion. Would that be okay? I hadn't carried the motion. Um, or did you want to have that discussion sir, well, prior to carrying the motion? I was going to ask. Uh, about two specific things Ben and I discussed in briefing that okay. may or may not need staff direction. So if we can hold for a second, I wouldn't mind if we do need staff direction, if perhaps the maker of the motion could okay. add those. Right. Um, but again, they may not, so I'll, I'll look okay. for our staff for that. Um, so the first part, and Christina, I think you, you kind of teed this up a little bit. Um, the math is really interesting about opportunity zone. I'm glad you're focused on that. And you mentioned the um, number and types of projects that are coming into design work. So I'm glad to see you're tracking that. And I also want to say, and that um, not only from staff but from others, I know that um, OEV staff, but I'm going to look at Director Perry particularly, is helping a lot of businesses as um, who are working through our growth management system and other things and really partnering with our other departments. So thank you for those efforts. I also want to acknowledge that we have a lot on the plate of all of our staff members and our director particularly. So my question was, is there a role perhaps for an interdepartmental team? This question for anyone who um, may have gone on the tour of Divvy Up Socks uh, just before the holidays, there were some questions there about new types of light manufacturing spaces and 
our growth management departments on both city and county side have done a tremendous job working on these new types of projects and facilities that we might have. General Capacitor was a new one for our community, those types of things. So I think the role of OEV has been exceptional in kind of working with our other departments. I just wondered if there might be a role for a formal interdepartmental group that could help a particular project, but also look for ways that we could enhance our systems on both county and city side, um, so that perhaps staff time isn't as necessary in the future if we've got some lessons learned. So I just, I wouldn't mind any thoughts you have as you've been working on these projects successfully. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try first here. Um, I, first and foremost, and thank you, uh, it, it was a great conversation in the briefing. Um, the city and the county both um, have really embraced the OEV model and having been one who served on the outside in economic development in our community and now seen the difference of how it is performing inside as a joint department of the city and the county, that was one promise that I can absolutely report to new commissioner and old has been kept. Um, I can tell you, for example, on the city side, we have, it, I want to say once every three weeks, we have meetings that OEV is a participant at uh, with all the various growth management departments, everything from the airport to, well, really everything under Wayne's domain. We do the same thing at the county. Um, I would like to uh, give a little praise here, though not to increase uh, you know, head circumference to our new director. Um, Christina takes the ombudsmanship role very seriously, but the other departments embrace um, that kind of connectivity very seriously. Well, both sides, city and county. You mentioned Divvy Up. That was a great example, actually, of how we were all able to pull together under the leadership, in that case of city management, and just dig into it. Bluntly, Dan Foss Turbicore was another great example. Uh, and there's others, they go on and on. Um, but I do want you to, regardless of whether you want an additional, the IA wants an additional sort of think tank or something for OEV to lead, I just want you to really know that that exists within the structure. That is a benefit of having um, a you know, department of place, but really it's just a joint city and county functionally consolidated department that's focused on these kinds of issues. And I, I head not to city management and county administration. So I guess, it, thank you for that, Ben. It, I think we are working well right now. I guess to lean into this a little bit more, I am concerned that with the wonderful expansion of the number of projects that we're working on, the growth of our entrepreneurs, that having our director serve as an ombudsman, Christina, it, um, one, there may be a slight tweak to something within growth management on either county or city side that could help in the future, and so it's not just uh, project specific each time. Even if this was an enhancement to design works, I know, Ben, you've said that you, you want more small businesses to come into design works and not just large projects. Um, I think being more strategic about this um, might be helpful to us. If a company is already kind of working within the partner group, they're gonna be directed towards OEV and get a lot of help. I think a more formal process may help us as our projects increase. So um, to make a motion, Commissioner Maddox, I think you made it. I, I don't know if this resonates with the rest of the board. We could hear from you all in the future mm -hmm. as those businesses, um, the number increases. But there is, um, we are going to see growth in this area. And I think um, we may need to look at this a little more strategically. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. We have a new team member coming on board on January 1st, too. Um, they come to us, Texas, Oregon, and back to Tallahassee. So you've got that nice boomerang effect there. And when, um, when they come on board, we'll definitely take a look at how we're interacting with our other departments and how we can improve that action moving forward. <laughs> and um, build upon those connections that Ben talked about that are already very strong. And we do appreciate all the support from the county and the city um, departments in particular as they are helping and committed towards us um, making it easier for our businesses to move through the process. Could we get an update September or December on those efforts and just see where we are in the interdepartmental work? Absolutely, we'll take a really close look at it um, over the next six months and definitely bring back a report to you in September. 
Thank okay, you. there's a motion on the floor and a second. Uh, oh, I'm yes. sorry, Mr. Chair. I did have I one. Uh, I had a second okay. quick right. one. Um, these are just two issues that came up in the last few months since our last meeting. The second one, um, Jorge Arce, who is you, uh, Department of Commerce, our trade representative. Yes. Or, yes. He offers a lot of support for um, companies that want to do export business, and we met him through the ACE trip, and he's been coming bi-monthly. I think it was the first direct takeaway you had, and mm -hmm. it was very exciting. So he reached out to me. We had a conversation, praised OEV's efforts. Has, he has been meeting with businesses in our area. He suggested that there could be workshops that do more outreach. I know this was something that Commissioner Deloge, you and I mentioned have our, after talking to a number of companies in town that were doing some exports maybe a year ago. Um, so I just wanted to raise that to see if we could get um, a update on that status and see if workshops are um, beneficial. And it may be something that we could partner with Regional Planning Council. Uh, he had mentioned working with companies in Sopchoppy and others. So is that acceptable? Do you need any other direction for that? Um, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions, comments? There's a motion on the floor. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. That takes us to item number 10, acceptance of the status report on the activities of the applied science and advanced manufacturing target industries. Um, thank you, commissioners. This is an update um, specifically on our efforts within applied science and advanced manufacturing, utilizing those um, resources that we know that we're glo globally competitive in. Um, I just wanted to note that Rebecca Sweat is our business development director in this, in this field, our manager here. Um, she's currently not with us today. She's uh, meeting with a company at HPMI, and she just let me know that that visit went really well. This company is specifically in with um, using our technology and research at HPMI to manufacture that. So um, hopefully we'll have a very positive update for you in June where we anticipate their decision period to be about a two to, th two to uh, six month process. So we're looking forward to that engagement. Um, as if you may know, in 1994, um, the Mag Lab opened its doors here in Tallahassee. And now for presidents and 24 years later, we'd like to um, put our flag down in the ground as the emerging magnetic capital of the world. Um, this, is not, um, this is made possible by key strategic partnerships, specifically being led and championed by Ricardo Schneider with Dan Foss Turbocore. I'm definitely part of driving that manufacturing as a fast growing industry. A lot of entrepreneurs in that area too, such as Divi up as you see there. So we're very excited to have his leadership, that with FSU, FAMU, and the College of Engineering, too, driving us forward and helping us build a business cluster in and around magnetic technologies. And with that, we have a, um, a video that we're just putting some final edits on, and we wanted to give you a sneak peek of why we're the magnetic capital of the world. All right, it is. As we move forward in this rapidly changing world, I think the one thing that we see every day is new technology emerging. And what we have in Tallahassee that's unique and special is we have all the various components that we need to do the cutting edge research, to develop new technologies, and to develop innovations. Maglab has been very important to us as we are highly dependent on magnetic knowledges. In the aerospace uh, arena, we have very advanced test facilities. We have very advanced materials characterization and manufacturing capabilities. They're all located within a few hundred yards of each other. So that's one of the things that makes it very good. We're very excited to be building our uh, new 44,000 square foot facility, expanding onto our current uh, building. We plan to hire over 100 um, new employees here in Tallahassee. So Tallahassee has broadened high magnetic field research from focusing mostly on physics to this much broader range of impact. And the partnership with Florida State University is a key part of the success of the Magnet Lab. Tallahassee is the right place because we have here in our community the infrastructure and the pool of talents that require to us to keep our number one position as a leader 
we're developing a series of videos um, utilizing this one, a much longer six minute one that talks a lot about the strength of our research, um, what Danfoss does uniquely in, its, in the world, and a little bit too on what, what makes Tallahassee specifically so special from our arts and culture standpoint as well. Um, so we're looking forward to um, branding these efforts as magnetic capital of the world. Um, specifically because, you know, this is just going into the mag lab. You have 1,800 1, um, users moving through our community. That doesn't include other visiting researchers and those people that are moving through Danfoss on a monthly, um, a monthly area here too. We're having discussions with um, the FSU um, applied science researchers on actually studying what that research tourism impact has to our community. Um, in January, we went to the Magnetics Conference down in Orlando. This is a conference that's international, um, specifically on magnetics and motors and drives. Um, this was brought to our attention by through the Magnetic Task Force, um, specifically um, Ricardo. His team participates in this on a, on a yearly basis. Um, we went down there, we sponsored a, uh, a reception that they had. We met with over 300 individuals and eight specific companies on um, talking about business and research opportunities there too. We also spent the last Saturday at the MagLab open house and what a great time we had there. They had almost 11,000 people move through there. Heath in the red shirt, he's with Dan Foss, an engineer there, actually um, is a lively graduate as well. Yep. And Kit, who you saw in the video, she comes to um, Dan Foss via TCC. Uh, so we had a great time. It was really um, remarkable. You know, remind me, we're in the mag lab. How many people we had moved in there that didn't know that they were going to see the world's largest magnet? So it was really, um, really a great time to be able to tell our region how this is so special and unique to Tallahassee. And that, and having Dan Foss there too was very eye-opening. The from kids to adults, he had a long line of people trying to figure out what his compressor was. <laughs> Um, so I mentioned the 300 people and the eight companies. This kind of gives you an idea of how we flow through our engagement with companies. We also worked with Florida Makes. They're a manufacturing association. <coughs> we do not have a manufacturing association here in town. Um, our hope is that we're developing that with Florida Makes. They have a large appropriation request in front of the legislature this year to um, be able to open their network to be in more areas that don't um, that they aren't currently in, and one of those is Tallahassee as well. So um, research on investment, there are consultants that do the business due diligence part for us. So they go in, they find out if a company is right for these types of conversations. They set up eight specific meetings for us at the Magnetics Conference. We took the opportunity engage, to engage them. We had two really unique visits that are stand out that I'd like to talk to you about. One company um, just recently expanded into Texas. Uh, we connected them into the university system um, to discuss research opportunities, and we're hoping that that lays the groundwork for a future expansion opportunity. They, he, ex he is anticipating on expanding his um, out of Texas in the next five years, so we're nurturing that conversation to hope hopefully um, be number one on his list when he's ready to talk expansion. Um, the second company that we engaged um, with is a UK-based company, and we're working with them to host them into our community in the next 45 days. So um, we're really excited about these efforts um, and, um, and what that means on an international level, too, to our community and the impact that that has. Um, we're also developing a scorecard specifically for applied sciences and advanced manufacturing. This is just the first initial piece of it. Um, the objective is to keep score within these targeted industries. We have a MAG task force meeting in the next couple of weeks. We're taking the scorecard to them, getting their input in it, and how we can continue to go back and reflect on that to make sure it captures um, the metrics that we need to show job growth, compensation, demand, and overall economic competitiveness. And um, it, just a quick story I'd wanna highlight too, in case you didn't get an opportunity to hear this in the paper. Um, so the little foam technology there was developed here at Florida State and utilized by the softball team when they won the World Series as a brace component. 
These are just, this is just one example of the many types of technology and innovation that exist a little bit outside, but yet related to magnetics with your advanced materials. And then lastly, you have a card at your table. If somebody asks you why we're the mag magnetic capital of the world, you can simply turn it over to the back and it highlights specifically why we are and those key initiatives and critical mass that help support and nurture this key area for us. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, are there any questions? Mr. Mr. Chair, Minor. just wanted to say this is really exciting work. Oh, it is. Um, I mean, I, I've not been on the commission for very long. I know many of you, uh, particularly Commissioner Dozier at Innovation Park has done a lot of work on this in, in addition to staff and it's just really exciting. I mean, I went to, uh, I met with Dr. Gary Ostrander about four or five years ago in his office and he talked to me about the opportunities related to magnetic technologies here in Tallahassee and, and just it, it changed forever my, my, pers my perspective on, on the opportunities that we have here. So. Um, kudos. Thank you very much. Yeah, it certainly makes us attractive. It does. <laughs> Mr. Commissioner Chair, Dozier. I, I just have to thank you, Commissioner Minor, for that comment, mm -hmm. but I, I want to say, looking at this material, I pulled out the, um, the card as soon as, you know, the meeting started here. This is what we see in other communities. Mm -hmm. um, four or five years ago before, it was just based on the conversation. This is what we could do. This is what we're doing now. And this is one of the most exciting pieces and it's an indication of what we can do on all these different pieces. So just well done and the progress you all have made in the last two years is exceptional. Um, it looks like we've been doing this for a long time yeah. and it really has only been the last couple of years that we've been really digging in and working on it. So um, th this is great. And I wouldn't, I'll, I'll just say because Autumn, you just smiled there. Blueprint doesn't get the same praise right now because it's been working so well, the infrastructure side for so long, right? So let's not leave that out. But OEV, new, it, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, excellent comments. Any other? Move out the door. Uh, there's a motion by Commissioner Maddox. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Bryant to accept option one as recommended by staff. Uh, any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign, motion carries uh, unanimously. That brings us to citizens to be heard on non agenda items. Do we have any speaker cards or anyone wanting to be heard? No speaker on, cards, Mr. On Chairman. non agenda items. Okay, then are there any further comments or questions, suggestions from members of the board? Commissioner Matlow. Hey, thank you. I had a brief discussion um, about this, and I think it may tie into somewhat of what Commissioner. Um, Dozier was talking about, um, but just the role of, um, and not knowing where it falls in, whether it's OEV or, or a city, but who, who is, um, is there a role of a facilitator, a liaison for startup businesses when they come to town who can kind of guide you through all the processes, whether it's being, getting your initial documents in order or navigating through permitting and just kind of, kind of seeing you through from day one till the day you get your CEO and then having that feeling of, Ben was my guy at the city of Tallahassee and it was great to do business there. And if we need, we need a role for that position and I think it could also serve a dual role of seeing the process play out over and over again and maybe um, identify some places where we can improve our processes. So I just wanted to throw out there if that's something you think would be in OEV's direction or? Well, I think it actually was, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, yes. uh, I think it was in line with actually what Commissioner Dozier um, said and the IA blessed us looking at and coming back with. I would note that uh, I believe growth management on the city has an individual that is unique to that. I would note that I, I know that county government and DSEM has a, forget his title, it's Barry Wilcox, but it be, does the same kind of thing. And I also would note that OEV does, uh, you know, serves that ombudsman role. But to look at, at strengthening that somehow, that's how I interpreted the prior motion. Yeah. Okay. So I think okay. we'll be reporting that back. Okay. Got it. Commissioner William Scott. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think the, in the last meeting, which was a, would have been our first blueprint meeting, I heard some um, brief discussions about the fairgrounds. Was there anything that we needed that was that we discussed in that last meeting that we needed to bring up here? Because we're we've received an email um, of something from the association, I think, about being involved in any additional conversation. I know it may have been in, at this point of the agenda last time, but it was mentioned. 
Ben? Uh, there was a couple things. There was a distribution of material about the fairgrounds, which was performed after the last meeting. Mm -hmm. There was also discussion that I think bled from that. Um, the mayor, Commissioner Minor, uh, and others um, speaking to developments along North Monroe. That will be coming, that issue will be coming back to you. We've already received IA direction on that. Uh, and that will be coming back to you at your June meeting. So, so that I'm clear, there's nothing, nothing other than getting ground. information on the fairgrounds. Not at this time. The other thing, too, is that I know that there was some mention of a 32304 uh, potential summit that was mentioned in the last blueprint meeting. Um, I think it was Commissioner Proctor who may have mentioned it. Um, so is there... Let me let me look at the minutes that you approved. I'm not okay. sure if that I don't passed. recall that okay. from the it may, have, it may have been a part of the conversation, but no, Commissioner. At this point, we no. have not been officially uh, contacted about participating, Mr. Vice Chairman. I don't know exactly what the county is doing, or if this is just Commissioner Proctor's show that he is hosting <clears throat> and facilitating the conversation. And Commissioner Proctor is not here to comment either. But we have not been formally contacted no. to participate in any form or fashion uh, in the proposed uh, summit. Mr. Chair, I think the idea of the summit, at least when Commissioner Proctor brought it up, was kind of put on hold because he wanted some financial commitment was the way I understood it. Mm. Okay. And, and we said, let's wait. But I think there's generally a feeling that we all need to figure out what can we do proactively to kind of get in front of this. So let me make sure I understand this. There is no actual summit coming up because I got something on my calendar. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, we got an announcement from Commissioner Proctor's office today about an April date. Right. But again, to Commissioner Deloge's point, there was an ask by Commissioner Proctor for funding during comment time at our last commission meeting. We did not have any substance, and this is something that he is, his office is organizing. Okay. It has not been All right. a request. Given the fact that so, yes. uh, Commissioner Proctor is Thank not you. here, and this actually is not an item for the... Uh, the IA board, um, um, we'll, we'll have to take it up as our individual commissions and where we go forward uh, from that perspective. Okay. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion to adjourn. We will stand adjourned. All right, see you later. Hey. <coughs>